we don't have to pray. We get to pray. Those nine little words have been changing my life. We don't have to pray. We get to pray. Turns on a simple distinction between an obligation and a privilege. There's those things in life we're obliged to do, and then there's those things we consider it a privilege to be able to do at all. It's a distinction that's very simple and that we understand, and yet it takes a while to get our heads around in practical ways. It's fun watching my children slowly get their heads around this distinction. Right? Uh, when I tell them to go sleep, they say, do I have to? Right? My, my children have to take a nap. I would love to take a nap. I would love to take two hours every day in the afternoon and sleep. That would be a privilege, wouldn't it? You'd be a very privileged person if you had the sort of job and the sort of independent income to be able to take a nap whenever you needed one, right? You know, I get to take a nap. You know, I get to take a nap. If I have time for a nap, if I have the freedom in my schedule to take a nap, that's a privilege. Huh? You know, but for my kids, it's an obligation. All they can see is what's right in front of their face. And I want to keep doing the thing I'm doing right now, and nap is an interruption, right? And as you mature and grow, you move in many things from an obligation to a privilege. You move from having to do something to getting to do something. Some things remain obligations forever, but many things start out as obligations but become a privilege. They start out as a burden but become a joy. They start out as something you have to do and they become something you get to do. The reason why my kids think they have to take a nap and I think I get to take a nap is that I understand the gift that rest is. They don't. They don't get it yet. So they just have to do it until they get it, right? We don't have to pray. We get to pray. The way from obligation to privilege in our prayer life goes through understanding it. Understanding why we pray, understanding what's actually happening in the act of prayer. Because when we get what's happening in prayer, then we realize that we don't have to pray, we get to pray. So I want to explore the mystery of the great privilege that prayer is for a few minutes with you tonight. And I want to do so by just asking a few simple questions. Uh, three, in fact. Shocker. Three. Uh, <clears throat> to whom do we pray? With whom do we pray? And by whom do we pray? And I think as we answer these questions, we'll have a sense of the depth of the riches of the mystery that prayer is and we will cease to think that we have to pray and more and more realize that we get to. So first, uh, to whom do we pray? Well, the simple sort of duh answer is God, right? We, we pray to God, right? But that, that's a sort of generic, any theistic religion would be able to give that answer. So let's, let's give some Christian content to that answer. Uh, Simply put, Christians would say that we pray to God the Father. We pray to God as Father. We pray to God our Father. In the first instance, we think of prayer as addressed to God the Father. When we come to God in prayer, we inevitably will come with uh, some kind of image in our minds of the one to whom we pray. It's inevitable. We're going to have an image in our mind. 
question is what kind of image is in there and does it need to be transformed and redeemed perhaps when you pray or those under your care pray the image is of a judge who is looking at you and saying it's been a while since I've seen you here right <laughs> um, and not a loving compassionate father who's just excited to see you this afternoon I was working at home and my little daughter came up and said oh gosh daddy can I can I snuggle with you it's like no you're interrupting me no no I didn't say that it's like yes please interrupt me I mean it broke my heart it's like I don't want to do my work yeah come snuggle that's great because of course she gets in and then within like one minute ooh, something else you know at least right so I'll, I'll take what I can get right <laughs> and if you fathers who are evil <laughs> would not give your child stone when asking for bread how much more would your heavenly father who is perfect I mean the father in heaven longs to spend time with us and it brings him joy when we bother him with our requests <laughs> it's not an interruption it's a joy for him perhaps the language of father for some of you doesn't help with the image perhaps your earthly father was absent or was harsh and the beautiful truth that God is our father is that he is like a father and everything that's good about fathers God has he thought it up and yet he is a father like no other father we've ever known he is the everlasting father who's always been a father and so didn't have to figure it out by trial and error and always will be a father and will never outgrow him and so the Heavenly Father the eternal perfect father longs to hear our cries longs to be bothered by us because it doesn't bother him at all it brings him joy when we come into his presence we don't have to pray we get to pray God is fulled, filled with joy when we come to him as our father and so we can come to him in prayer in joy not as a burden, not as something we have to do, but as something we get to do. For the very joy that he has when we come to him, we too can share in that joy. We don't have to pray. We get to pray. Now, now I must pause and say, how is it that I can speak so confidently that God is in fact a compassionate father towards us? But by what right, by what authority, on what grounds could I make such a claim? Is that just wishful thinking? Hey, I didn't really have a great dad on earth, so I'll pretend God's a great guy. I mean, you know, maybe I'm just making this up. Well, well, well I, I promise you I'm not. And that, but that brings us to our second question, which is with whom do we pray? We pray to God the Father, but we pray with Jesus Christ. When we pray, we join our voices with the voice of the risen Christ who is in perpetual intercession for us before the Father. I like at, thinking about things just in general, but th this one always kind of bugs me. Where is Jesus? It's sort of a tricky one because, you know, He's with us, but he's in my heart, but he's in heaven. Like, how does he do all that, right? Uh, but, yeah. And, and it seems to, it's been helpful for me to think, okay, all these things can be true at once, but where do I want to start? Where, where do I want to kind of stand and look from to make sense of all that? And over time, it's become clearer and clearer to me that the place to start with this question, where is Jesus, is the answer that the New Testament gives over and over again, and it's encapsulated in the creed, that after raising from the dead and ascending into heaven, he sits at the right hand of the Father. In the second article of the Creed, the stuff on Jesus in the Creed, that's the only present tense of her. The only thing Jesus is doing now, a bunch of stuff he already did, and there's stuff he's going to do, come back, judge the world, all that cool stuff. There's only one verb, the thing he does now. 
sitting, right? He's sitting. It's called the, the session, the session of Christ. He ascended, and now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And it's sort of like, ooh, fun metaphysical fact. Somewhere, and where is the right hand of God? Is that over here? Like, I mean, like, I'm not sure exactly where that is. Is it behind Saturn? Um, but right, the right hand of God apparently isn't a place like normal places because he can also be in my heart and with me and in whenever two or three are gathered. So the right hand of God's some other special, really cool, authoritative thing. But the, the deep significance that he's at the right hand of the Father is not about where he is at all. It's about what he's doing. And he's sitting. Now, now does this mean he's like, got his feet up on the desk? He's like taking a break. The Father's benched him, you know, have the Spirit take over for a little bit till the end, you know. Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. <laughs> Not only in his life of obedience unto death did he intercede for us once and for all, praise be to God, but he even now is perpetually interceding for us. So when we pray, we join the risen Christ in his prayer life. There's no such thing as private prayer. <laughs> Three's the minimum, right? Father, right, right? Before we say our Father, Jesus Christ is already praying. And after you say, Amen, he's still praying. That's maybe why we say, in Jesus' name, amen. You take over, right? That's what that is. That's the handoff. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is always already praying and always will be praying. It would be a great tragedy if the church did not pray. It would be a great tragedy for us and for the world. But there is one who would still be praying, even if a whole generation of the church lost its prayer life the risen son, Jesus Christ. So why not join him? <laughs> we don't have to pray. We get to pray. We are joining a conversation that's already happening. We don't have to create it out of nothing. We can join a conversation that's already happening. Prayer is a lot less like how we usually think, which is here you're you know, in the lobby and there's, you're going up and talking to a stranger. It's, 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 there's nothing like that at all. It's much more like two friends talking and they see you from a distance and say, they wave you into the conversation that they're already having. You're joining a conversation that's already taking place. We don't have to pray. We get to pray. We get to join in on this eternal conversation. And I don't know about you, but once you start to look at it that way, <laughs> I'm inclined to just, you know, take off my feet and say, you know, take off, no. Take off my shoes. I mean, that, that's holy ground. I mean, he's motioning us over, but really, I don't know. Do I even belong in that conversation? Maybe that's a little too high for me. Okay, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have to, but I'm not even sure if I should. <laughs> that's a little beyond me. I, I, I'm out of my league here. <laughs> I, what am I going to say? You know, you ever in those conversations with people who are just, really smart and interesting, and you're like, I'm just going to listen, right? <laughs> that might be a good place to start in your prayer. But you're, you're kind of out of, we're out of our league, out of our league here, and so maybe it's just, okay, now we don't have to pray, but sh should we at all? This is too big for us. Let Jesus do it, you know? Like, how could my words ever be as grand as his? How could I ever pray like he does in John 17, you know? And this brings us to our third and last question. By whom do we pray? We pray to God the Father, joining with Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. By whom do we pray? We pray by the Spirit. And not just being spiritual, but by the Holy Spirit the one and only set apart spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus Christ. By that one spirit that unites 
God and Jesus Christ together, by that spirit, we have all that it takes to join this conversation. Right? In Romans 8, Paul says that uh, the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. I mean, part of the Spirit's role when we pray is to just remind us, yeah, yeah, you belong here. <laughs> you're welcome here. You're, you're a part of this conversation already. You're welcome here. And then Paul goes on to say that when we don't know what to pray, which feels like a lot of the time, right? And the more we get the sense of the conversation we're joining, you're going to start feeling like you have less and less. To say. Whoa, <laughs> I have no idea what to say. When we don't know what to pray, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groans <laughs> too much for words. Right? And he that knows all thoughts, that's the Father, will draw out his will. So the Holy Spirit makes up for what's lacking in our imperfect prayers. He perfects our prayers. He completes our incomplete prayers. <laughs> so we have no reason to worry about having something to say when we pray. Yeah, you are out of your league, buddy. And you'll never not be out of your league in this conversation. You're never going to pray like Jesus. Doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit will make up for whatever's lacking in your prayer. He will make up for whatever is lacking. So what does that mean? It means jump right in. <laughs> Don't don't think that this is a conversation you can't join until you're ready, until you're more mature. You'll, you'll never be ready for this conversation. Because <laughs> by the time you catch up, they're already light years ahead of you. So you just, just jump right in. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, and he will make up for whatever's la lacking, so that you almost get this sense that by the time our prayers make it to the Father's ears, they do sound just like Jesus. have to pray. <laughs> we get to pray. We, when we pray, we pray to God the Father. We join with Jesus Christ in his prayer life, and we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may have noticed something. You may have noticed a little that there were three things. <laughs> I do teach theology. That's what they pay me for. One, two. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God in three persons, one God. God is the one to whom we pray. God is the one with whom we pray. And God is the one by whom we pray. The doctrine of the Trinity is this grandest and most difficult of doctrines, and yet it's actually just the grammar of prayer. It's just what's happening when we pray. Which means, when we pray, we are participating in the eternal life of God. When we pray here on earth, we are tasting a bit of heaven here. When we pray in time, we are glimpsing eternity. When we pray in these time between the times, we have a foretaste of the glory that's to come. We don't have to pray. We get to.